Welcome to our series, The Fruit of the Spirit. Uh, we are working on memorizing a couple of verses. These are our core verses for this series out of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So let's go over these if we would together. And if you don't know these, you can act like you know these and you can read them up here on the screen. The verses are these, Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. We're talking today about joy. When I was growing up as a kid, kind of in a church setting. You may have learned this song when you were a kid, even if you weren't in a church setting. The song went along like this. It says, I've got joy down in my heart. Nobody's going to sing that, are you? Deep, deep down in my heart. J-O-Y, down in my heart. Deep, deep down in my heart. And he goes on to say, Jesus put it there. And nothing can destroy. And if you were kind of in an amped up setting, it would go, mm. you know, nothing can destroy, destroy, destroy. Mm. And it was a song I learned as a kid. But the question I want to ask today is, is this. Is that true? And if it's not true, what I believe is it can be. Because I believe when Jesus came, had his... Uh, earthly public ministry, uh, one of the things he communicated to his disciples before he departed, went to the cross, is that he told them, he says, I've, I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that, and this is a fascinating statement that Jesus makes, and that your joy may be full. And I don't know what you think about when you think about Jesus but one thing that we need to connect with our understanding of Jesus is that Jesus is pro-joy. Paul, one of the writers of the New Testament, as he's writing to Rome, and Rome is like a lot of churches, they've got issues going on, fighting over these peripheral issues. And, and he says to them about the kingdom of God, he says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. In other words, it's not about all these kind of peripheral uh, secondary issues. He said the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so what we find is that joy is, is actually God's agenda for our life. Uh, joy is something that, if we think about the impact it's had on us culturally and nationally, uh, our inalienable rights granted to us in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, many people, one of their primary goals in life is to have greater joy because, and we all experience this and know this, joy just makes everything better. I mean, there's nothing in our life that gets worse with greater joy. If you've ever had like a bad or challenging job situation or work environment, um, you may give lots of complaints as to the reasons why that was a bad or a toxic environment, but I would just about bet none of you have ever said this. Like the problem I had with my boss, the problem I had with my coworkers, like the problem I had with my work is it just gave me too much joy. <laughs> right? and, and in our relationships, like I've, I've never had somebody come to me and say, you know, Pastor, I, I, I need counseling because in my family or, or in my marriage, you know, we've got a, a lot of things that are going that are good. The problem is my wife and our marriage, we just, we just have too much joy. Right? I mean, it just doesn't happen, does it? Because we, we just understand this intuitively. Joy is something that just, it just makes life better. Well, Solomon, a man, wrote years and years ago, a very wise man. He talks about this, a cheerful heart. It's, it's like good medicine, but a crushed spirit, it, it rots the bones. And what doctors, you know, medical folks are finding now is that, that joy and this overall positive outlook in life is something that actually can be associated with greater immune systems. And there are all these benefits that come with joy. But joy is something for Jesus that, that allowed him to endure the cross. This neat little phrase in Hebrews 12. It says, for the joy set before him, he, Jesus, endured the cross. And joy was something that gave Jesus staying power. Joy gives us staying power. It gives us the ability to go through, endure difficult, challenging things. And ultimately, joy is just something that we all need more of. Our families need more joy. Our homes, our children, 
our society, our churches, I mean, uh, school systems. We need more joy. But here's the, here's the big challenge. When, when I start thinking about talking about joy, there are some of you who have already started doing this. You've already started thinking, yes, but. Joy is for those people who are joyful. Joy is for those Pollyanna, pie in the sky, eternally optimistic people who are burying their heads in the sand and they don't realize how bad life really is. Like, like joy is for people, we, we tend to think of it as like an innate trait that we either have or we don't. And so we approach the topic of joy, we can tend to have a fixed mindset that from the very beginning, we exclude the possibility that we could actually have more joy. And so from the beginning, what I would say is that this, that what if there's a possibility that God would want you to have greater joy? What if there's a possibility that you in your life, not that you have to become this kind of pie-in-the-sky person who just ignores all the bad stuff in the world, but what if there's a possibility that for you in your life, you could actually live with a greater sense of joy in your day-to-day -day existence? I believe that there is a way. And so what we're going to do today is look at two questions. The first is, what is joy? As Paul speaks about it in this fruit of the Spirit, what does he mean by that? And then the second question is this, very practical. How do we find more of it? What is joy? First of all, we begin there in trying to define what Paul speaks of in Galatians chapter 5. And that the simplest definition I would give to joy is this. It's a deep gladness. I typically give kind of the caveat that it's a deep gladness in something other than ourselves. Because we don't find joy in a narcissistic, uh, kind of navel-gazing, just focused on ourselves. We find joy in some source external to ourselves. And so joy is this deep gladness. And one definition that's floated around a lot as of late, is it says that joy is a, it's a settled certainty that God is in control. You may have seen this in memes or, or different things on social media. And what I would say to that is that, that we do need to have a settled certainty that God is in control, but that's faith. That's not joy. And while faith helps drive and contribute to joy, those two things are actually, they're distinct from one another. But joy is simply this. It's a deep gladness in something other than ourselves. It's something that can be maintained. It's something that can abide within us. A lot of discussion is had on the topic of joy versus happiness. I would encourage you, if you're interested, Randy Alcorn has a great book called Happiness on this topic. And and he makes a point that I think we sometimes overstate the case that there's a clear distinction between joy and happiness. And I won't go into the details, but what I will say about the understanding of joy as it relates to happiness is that if you are a miserable, unhappy person, you're probably not experiencing much joy. Because there is some kind of connection between the two. It is a deep gladness that abides with us Joy is something that can actually coexist with things like sorrow and suffering. And so if you begin to think about the topic of joy and your first thought is, well, I can't have joy because I have sorrow. I can't have joy because I've got suffering right now. Um, it was said of Jesus, Isaiah 52 and 53, this kind of great messianic prophecy, where, where the writer Isaiah there um, gives a portrait and a picture of Jesus and his character. And he makes a statement of Jesus. Um, he says this, that he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Now think about that for a moment. If we say that joy cannot coexist with sorrow, well, we're really saying that Jesus couldn't have joy. But in reality, Jesus was filled with joy. He was filled with the Spirit. So joy is something that can actually coexist at the same time with sorrow. Paul said it this way in one of his letters to the church in Corinth. He says, we are always, we are sorrowful. In other words, there's mourning and there's pain, there's, there's grief. He says, we're sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So, so the encouraging thing to know about joy is that it is, it's a deep and it's, it's an abiding gladness. 
It's something that we can actually carry with us into the sorrows of life. James makes a statement that personally I'm not all that crazy with, but he actually says joy is something that can coexist with suffering. And James, in his first chapter, in his letter, he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you, and we would tend to say, um, when you do well in life, when you're successful, but he says, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So when we're asking the question, what is joy? Well, it's a deep, it's abiding gladness in something other than yourself. It's something that we can carry with us through everything that we go through in life. Just like the rest of the fruit of the Spirit, we would look at the rest of the fruit of the Spirit and we would say, love is something that we should always have. We don't look at it and say that it's situational. Faithfulness is something that we should always have. It's okay in this circumstance if I'm not faithful. We would say, no, no, those are things that should permeate um, our life on a consistent basis. So it is the same with joy. The question is, how in the world does that ever happen? How do we begin finding greater joy? I'm going to share with you three ways that we can move toward greater joy. The first is, and hopefully this is somewhat obvious, but helpful to point out, we have to begin looking for it. If you want to have greater joy, it begins with this belief that Jesus says that he wants us to have his joy. That joy is something that's not reserved for for just people who have a, a different kind of genetic set point for happiness, which some people do. Bless their hearts. Joy is something that can actually be influenced, and we have to embrace from the very beginning that God wants us to have this. This is a fruit of His Spirit. And oftentimes, the joy or the lack of joy we experience has more to do with our perspective than it does the reality itself. You've heard about a new couple, they move into a neighborhood, and husband and wife, and they have a habit of sitting down in the morning, eating breakfast at the breakfast table. They can see out their big windows just outside, and the wife has a bit of a, a critical spirit, and so as she looks out and she sees the neighbor's laundry out there on the clothesline, she remarks to her husband, she says, would you look at her laundry? It's dingy, it's dirty, and so the husband hears this, and okay, so second morning, same thing, clothesline out there, there are the clothes, they're dingy, they're dirty, they're not clean, so the the wife communicates this, and this goes on for several weeks, and one morning, finally, they sit down there at the breakfast table, get ready to eat their breakfast, the wife looks out, sees the clothes, and all of a sudden, things are different, things have changed, the clothes are clean. And she remarks to her husband, can you believe she's learned how to to wash clothes? You would think that she would have known by now, but I guess she's figured out how it is that she could get her clothes clean. I'm grateful that we don't have to look at her dirty, dingy clothes any longer. And to that, the husband says, "Well, well, actually, dear, I just washed our windows. There are a lot of times in our life we look at the world, we look at our circumstances, we see dirty laundry. Right? It doesn't look good, doesn't look right. The 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 fix, the, the, the problem that we need to address, oftentimes it is not somebody else's dirty laundry. It's, it's our own windows. It's our own perspective in, in how we're viewing things. It's what it is that we're actually looking at that's causing us to see things in a certain way. That they're, I'm going to give these to you as, as four thieves of joy. These are ways of looking at the world around us that, that eliminate our ability to, to have joy. And consequently, these are things that if we need find these present in our life, these are areas that we need to clean the windows of our soul, of our perspective. The first thief to our joy 
is this thing that we call comparison. Uh, comparison is when you're looking at the good things that somebody else has and bemoaning what you don't have. Typically leads to things like envy and greed. And when the window through which we view the world is comparison, they've got this, I don't have this, it removes, it robs us of our ability to have joy. Uh, another thief of joy is complaining. Complaining is when we're looking at here's what's wrong in our life to the exclusion over here's what's good. Here are the burdens I'm carrying and we exclude any potential blessings. When we look at the things that we can complain about and we give voice to those, it typically leads us to eliminate the potential for joy. Another thief of joy is this thing called bitterness. Attached to unforgiveness, it's looking at what somebody else has done wrong to me, focusing on, obsessing on that, and it's something that causes the whole world around us, specifically in our relationships, to look dirty and dingy. But in reality, it's probably something that we need to clean our own windows in. A fourth thief of our joy is just this thing called self-pity. It's when we look at what's wrong, we feel sorry for ourselves. How could this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? And can we just, I know this is church, but could we be honest for just a minute? The self-pity is just something that can be kind of a default, something that we go to. For me, I've got kind of this kind of uh, my default can be like a critical spirit, and the window through which I can see the world is is one where I can find any potential problem, any potential challenge, um, and it, if I'm not careful, that will lead to a place of woe is me. And what needs to happen, the very first thing, if we want to live with greater joy, is we start cleaning the windows of our soul. To, to believe that we could actually have joy. That God's word is stronger than what I feel. It's stronger than what I experience. That God's word, when Jesus says he wants us to have joy, to have it to the full, that his kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That joy is something that we can experience and something we can express. And so if, if I may meddle for a moment, if you have the perception that your default and your disposition is someone that is just not joyful. Try to say as graciously and nicely as I can. That's a lie. Because as the Spirit works and moves, as we yield to and depend on the Spirit of God to lead us, He'll lead us into greater joy. A deep gladness, a deep abiding in something other than ourselves. And so first of all, we want to, to look for joy if we're ever going to receive it. The second way that we move toward and find greater joy, and this is, if you've zoned out at all, zone back in, because this is the key, I believe the core of what needs to happen in our lives. It's number two, it's to begin rejoicing. To begin rejoicing. If you say, I want greater joy, I don't know how to bring about greater joy, rejoicing is the primary thing that need, needs to happen in order for us to have it. Rejoicing is to strengthening joy what lifting weights is to strengthening muscle. If any of us were to say, I'd love to get strong, I'd love to get big muscles, why won't they grow? I'm just, I'm just not a strong person. And some of us, like myself, could kind of say we're more on the wiry end of things. Some truth to that. But in reality, if we complain about not having muscle, but we're not doing anything to build it, do we really have a right to complain? In reality, I think there's a cause and effect relationship between rejoicing and joy. And to put it plainly, that, that your level of joy will never rise greater than your level of rejoicing. Uh, 
rejoicing is an act of obedience. It's a choice. It's the decision to look at that which is good. Joy is the outcome of that obedience. Joy is the the outcome of rejoicing. So joy is something that follows rejoicing. And in the same way, if you want greater, greater muscle, greater strength, you lift weights. If you want greater joy, you rejoice. You find that there are good things in this world, and you focus on those, again, not in a um, kind of eternally optimistic, everything is great in the world sort of perspective, but you choose to see those things which are good. And, and if you were to say, okay, I would love to rejoice, the problem is I've got 10 to 1 things that I should not be rejoicing about. Like I've got 10 to 1 problems and challenges and issues and stressors and unknowns. I've got all kinds of health things going on and family things going on. I've got all these things that these are things that I, I can't rejoice in these. So if you were to say, what can I rejoice in? Well, let me give you two things that you can rejoice in. And let me press on you. When you think about these two things, your perspective may be, well, I'll find joy someday. Right? Or, or I'll become a more joyful person someday. Like when the disease is healed, when the relationship gets mended, when, you know, whatever it is, I'll find joy someday. What I'd like to do is press you in and, and say, if you begin rejoicing in these two things today, it can begin leading to greater joy today. Joy is not something that is this um, kind of uh, gold at the end of the rainbow type thing. It is something that we can begin moving into today. So the first thing that we can begin rejoicing in is a person, specifically the, the person of, of Jesus. Now, Paul, the same man who wrote Galatians and gave us the fruit of the Spirit through the Holy Spirit, is also the same person who wrote much of the New Testament. And he wrote one particular letter to a church in, in Philippi. And this letter, it, it, it radiates with joy. You know, some people refer to it as the letter of joy. The interesting kind of backstory to the, the background of, of this letter is we want to know all the details, but Paul, when he wrote this letter, was under confinement of some kind. He, he was being imprisoned at this time. And so what you might think, if, like, if I'm writing a, pri- a letter to someone from prison, I'm, I'm probably going to let you know about all the things that have been done wrong to me and all the things that should not have happened, all the injustice. You know. But Paul, in this letter, he doesn't take that tone. In fact, he makes a statement in his fourth chapter in Philippians. He, it's just it's kind of spellbinding. He makes a statement in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Again, he's, he's imprisoned at this moment, and he says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Can, can you say ouch if you find that difficult? Because it's not rejoice in the Lord when you get the promotion. Rejoice in the Lord when the report comes back and it's all clear. Rejoice in the Lord when the situation gets remedied to the way that you would want. It's rejoice in the Lord. And then this phrase, this was the word, always. It's not to be something that is situational. It's to be something that is permanent and ongoing. Now, how can Paul say that? It's because Paul is not rejoicing in his possessions. He's not rejoicing in his freedom. He's not rejoicing in his circumstances. If you go back and look at what Paul calls us to rejoice in, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in a person. And we, you've experienced this, but that where you find your joy is also where you'll lose your joy. And that, I think there's power when Paul says to us, the source, the place we go to, the core place we find, this, this deep abiding gladness 
It's, it's not in possessions. It's not in our retirement. It's not in the stock market. It's not in some kind of physical circumstances. The core place we find our joy is in Jesus. And so therefore, we rejoice in Him. We rejoice in a person. And the thing about rejoicing in possessions and the joy that we find from possessions, from how things are going materially or physically, is that that type of joy tends to be immediate, but it tends to be brief. I mean, it's immediate, it hits, we get the dopamine or whatever it is that's going on, but it's brief, it's, it's gone as quickly as it comes. And we get the new phone, and wow, that's cool, and then we got to go search for something else. We get the new car, we get the, you know, whatever it is. The, the joy that we derive from temporary things will always be temporary. It won't be lasting. Whereas the joy we find from a person, when we're rejoicing in Jesus, that type of joy may not be as immediate, may not be like a lightning bolt, may be more gradual, but here's the great thing, it's lasting, it's permanent, it's something that the world can't give, and consequently, the world can't take away, it's, it's something that that. Our health can't take away. It's something that death can't take away. It's something that grief can't take away. It's something that cancer can't take away. Dementia can't take away. I mean, that there's nothing that can take this away because we find it in a person. And if I may, I want to dig it just a little bit closer to look at Paul's perspective here on joy. It is that this joy that Paul had in Jesus was brought about because Paul genuinely believed that Jesus was near to him, that Jesus was with him, that Jesus was for him. If you look at Philippians 4, verse 5, Paul says, Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Notice this, the Lord is near. And the, the concept, I think, that bookends um, this incredibly powerful passage uh, in verses 4 on following is this idea of Jesus' presence with us. You, you drop down to verse 9. Paul says, The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Practice these things, and notice this, and the God of peace will be with you. How can Paul rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the person of Jesus? It's because he believed Jesus was with him. Paul's understanding of where Jesus was located did not depend upon where Paul was located. He's imprisoned at the time. So for Paul, he had an understanding of Jesus' presence that transcended his earthly position, his earthly situation. He just believed that Jesus was with him, that Jesus was for him, and that was not going to change. So for us, may we do the same. May we rejoice in the person of Jesus. And then ultimately, may we be people who rejoice not only in a person, but secondly, we rejoice in, in a promise promise of eternal life, the promise of heaven. Jesus, in his words, he encourages us in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. He says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Bit of a convicting question. When's the last time you rejoiced that your names are recorded in heaven? If, if you're in Christ, you believe in Him, you've trusted in Him, you, you know you're one of His children. When's the last time that you've consciously rejoiced and said, Jesus, I've got a lot of things in my life that I don't want to rejoice about. I've got people I don't want to rejoice about. I've got issues I don't want to rejoice about. But I can go to this fixed thing that you are here, you are for me, you are with me, and there is a promise that you have given me that this world can't grant and this world can't take away. It is the promise of eternal life. And I would just challenge you, as we read through kind of the landscape of the whole New Testament, we're consistently, through all of the writers, called to an eternal perspective, to fix our eyes not on that which is seen, because that which is seen is temporary, Paul would say. We're to fix our eyes on that which is unseen, that which is eternal. And so we come in and we say, well, I just, I just, I'm not a person of joy. Kind of got an Eeyore type complex, you know, woe is me. Then ask yourself this question, are you, are you lifting spiritual weights? 
Are you making the choice, the choice, the choice to rejoice? Not, not in a glib, oh, all is well in the world and I have to pretend that things are always perfect. No, no, no. It's, it's assessing and realizing, yeah, man, there's some issues and challenges in this world. But my goodness, this world is not my home. My citizenship is in heaven. And I eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, that gives us power. That gives us strength. And again, that's not something that you have to wait for the circumstances of your life to change before you can begin doing I would just challenge you. If your mindset is, well, you know, I'm just not a joyful person, or maybe I'll be more joyful when this other person stops being so miserable in my life, whatever it is, I don't know. Begin moving into that joy today through rejoicing in a person, Jesus Christ, and the promise that He's given us of eternal life. Rejoice that heaven is not a goal, it's a promise. I mean, heaven is not something that we're striving, oh, am I going to make it? You know, did I do enough good stuff? No, heaven is a promise that Jesus has given us based upon what he has done for us. The final, the third and final way that we can begin finding greater joy is, is essentially to do this. It's to look for it with others. If you think about the times in your life where you've experienced the most joy, my guess is it was not when you were on your own. My guess is it was most likely when you were with others. And if we want to raise the level of our joy, we need to understand that joy flourishes in community. It tends to wither in isolation. And I don't know how connected you are, what your relationships are like right now, but we, we talk often here about community groups and getting connected. And, and I would encourage you, if, you, if you've not taken that step, found a way to get connected, to find, do that, get involved in a Bible study, do something. And if it's not here within the life of our church, I don't know where it is, but find some place where you can connect with others, not a group of Eeyores, not a group of people who are pessimists and everything is wrong and the sky is falling and life is terrible. But connect with people who are real and honest and genuine. And they've got their hope set. Their, their, their joy is found in the person of Jesus and in the promise of eternal life. And then begin letting that connection that you have. Their joy infuse your life and your joy infuse theirs. And the, the prayer ultimately would be that we would experience the joy of the Lord. And that, that we would begin to express in our families, in our marriages, in our relationships with our children, grandchildren, we would begin to express that joy. We would take captive the thought that says, well, I'm just not a joyful person. We would say that that's a lie. It's not true. That joy is something that comes from the Holy Spirit. And if I've got the Holy Spirit of God in me, I can have the joy of the Holy Spirit in me. We really embrace that. And then we begin living in such a way that we say, yeah, I've got some pains. I've got some issues. I've got some hardships present in my life. I acknowledge those. I bring those before the Lord. I share those with Him. But at the very same time, I don't let that cloud my entire vision of the world around me. I don't see life through a dirty window. I see life through the lens of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus and the promise of Jesus. I rejoice in those things. And I know this, and this is really what the, the whole message comes down to. That, that the central truth is this, that lasting joy comes from these two things, and this is the challenge, comes from rejoicing in the person of Jesus and the promise of eternal life.